Here, give me one second. I hate to be a, I hate to be rude. My cat's being a is crying. No, that's okay. All right, kitty. All right, there you go. Do your thing. I'm Dylan, and join me as we look back on the rich history of doom metal and its sister sounds based on the recounted tales of its followers. Every week, we will have a different guest to spin their yarn. You can visit the website at diaryofdoom.com, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, follow the podcast on diaryofdoom.podbean.com, and subscribe and listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you may get your podcast from. If you have a question or want to pitch something, you can fire off an email to diaryofdoom1968 at gmail.com. And we also have a Patreon that you can support for additional episodes and whatnot. You can find that over at patreon.com slash diaryofdoom. Uh, going to be premiering something on the Patreon in the coming weeks in April. Um, uh, we're recording this at the tail end of March, but by the time this episode comes out, uh, if we will be into, uh, you know, the, ho- the holiday month, so to speak, uh, and k- kick it off. We have from Portland, Maine, uh, the band project, uh, experiment, uh, and actually you're going to have to tell me, how do you pronounce it? So I say Boozem, but you could say Boozem, however it's, uh, the way I like to think of it, man, is that the fact that the way that there's. The way that there's the U and the E going on there, it's however you want to pronounce it. All right. I'm going to go with your version. So it's Buzem. Yep. All right. So as I just said, we have Buzem, and behind that project is uh, a guy named Finn, and he plays bass and makes a lot of noise with that. So welcome to Diary of Doom. Thank you, man, for having me. So uh, the thing about this uh, noise experiment um, is that uh, it's kind of hard to even to like pin down like all of your releases because you have put out a lot of shit over the last couple of years. Um, Before we get into that and leading up to it, you know, where, what are your earliest experiences with music? Did you grow up in a musical household or did you have to find uh, music on your own? Uh, So my mother was always playing piano. She had this big, huge piano. We had all the way up until I think it was about like, maybe 18 or 20 years old. Uh, I got forced to play violin at uh, nine and sucked at that. <laughs> I never practiced it. No, I would always be forced to do uh, acoustic guitar lessons and stuff like that. And it was always um, one tried to make me play like church music. Another made me play some of the worst songs I can't even remember anymore. <laughs> but um, when I was 16 on my birthday, I got a bass. It was an Ibanez. And I was super into Ambix at the time. And oh, the the DB band, the uh, yeah, the band, yeah, Amb- yeah, the guy. Um, but so what, what ended up happening was when I was 19, I had that bass and I pawned it, made the biggest fucking mistake of my life. To ever <laughs> do that. And it wasn't until now, all these years later, that I've uh, got myself back into it. Uh, so you mentioned that you were into. Uh, I, I've always pronounced that band. I, I guess this is the episode where I just don't pronounce band names correctly. Um, I've always referred to them as Amoebics. Um, I didn't. I don't know if that's correct or not. Was that like one of your first uh, heavy bands, or did you find like heavy metal? Because like uh, it took me a little while to find out about bands like um, Amoebics or Discharge. Like that, they're kind of like that layer below that. Yeah. They're, they're like those bands that influence the bands that I really like. I had always be been into heavy, heavy, heavy music. I know they're not heavy, but I was a super Smashing Pumpkins fan when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And I had a friend of mine who was always into the harder stuff. 
And every time I'd go hang out with him, he was always showing me the bigger and bigger and better and this and whatnot. And so we were always into the local punk scene and whatnot um, up in Boston. So, you know, I was growing up as young as I think at least 10, you know, being super into toxic narcotic and bands like that. And so I've always been into that. I've had some mass bands on in, in the past and they talk about that obviously like a big punk scene, punk and hardcore movement there. So you grew up in, in Massachusetts and then eventually you find your way up to uh, Portland, Maine at some point. <laughs> yeah. I had, um, so we moved to Florida and then life goes as life does. Went to Texas, to California, got so broke as shit, went back to Florida and after living in Florida, um, went to a Yob and Bellwitz show and said, I'm gladly leaving this place. And <laughs> came up to Maine. Nice. It's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good, some good exit music. Would you say like Smashing Pumpkins, one of their albums was like a landmark album for you? Or did you find something else that was like, that made you uh, think about uh, heavy music in a different way? No, it was more of always just the, um, I was really into what, how Billy Corgan sang. Mm -hmm. I mean, their music, their music is great. I think they have one of the best bassists, but also their guitarist was great. But no, it was always just, I just like the way that Billy Corgan sang. And I was always into that kind of, um, type of sound when I was younger. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll, uh, you know, kind of get into your shit now so what made you want to start exploring the noisier aspect of heavy music because your music is similar to sun in that it lacks kind of traditional structure and builds mostly off of simple riffs and feedback and you know it's total noise manipulation um except you like you said you use bass versus them who predominantly use guitars at least right. uh and all the all the times i've seen them it's been guitars and other just weird esoteric instruments i had wanted to do a heavy music project for at least the last eight years never did anything just buggered off never really got my ass doing anything and what ended up happening was um in 2020 i uh, started hanging out with a lot of people and i kept noticing all of these cannabis events and whatnot that go on None of them have heavy music, and yet you think we're a bunch of stoners. You would want to have heavy music. And I um, was like, well, I'll I'll try this. And, I mean, for the, about the year before that, I'd, I tried to be a vocalist. And it's kind of hard sometimes to find people up here who want to join a band. They all expect that you're going to do Grateful Dead cover bands, which I'm a deadhead, but I don't want to be a cover band. <laughs> right. So it was more or less after taking a, a window pane of acid and smoking some DMT that I came out of it going, all right, I figured it out. And ever since then, it's been trying to emulate what I think that even sounds like. And that's been going on for the last two years. That's uh, an interesting approach to it. But like, I guess that makes sense. Like you, so you're just trying to parse out into another medium, like what that experience was and like what we're listening to is the equivalent of being like oh this is like if somebody put like a, an acid trip onto like one of the whatever that is like a so, uh, not a sonogram but like the music grammar it's like oh it's a visualizer i see what's happening now and it looks insane yeah. it's very much trying to uh emulate it but but i mean the one thing that i laugh about was that originally i never was doing heavy like all the doomy drone stuff but mm -hmm. it originally started out actually uh, doing Dungeon Synth. But that was also okay. because that was all I had. I, I had a keyboard and that was it. So I was like, all right, we'll do this from here. So even if you listen to all the beginning of that stuff, it's still the same stuff now. It's just one was with a keyboard. Now I go back to the bass. Right. And maybe that's like, you know, that's like a kind of a, a good way to bring it up too. Like, obviously your project name has a slight familiarity to it, considering like, you know, Burzum is also a thing. And then, you know, Dungeon Synth is kind of tied in with that too. And I, you know, I had to ask in our initial emails about it. So like, what made you go with a potentially troublesome name? So um, I was sitting around one day and I kept putting a name around and I thought it was funny. I'm like, how do you say... Burzum, 
if you're from Boston, drop the R. <laughs> that was okay, that was freaking hilarious. I, I that was like that is great. I'm like, you know, that's what Burzum fans sound like when they're in Boston. And um I don't even know where the name comes from. I really do not. I I was just going, I just made it up on the spot and I thought it was cool. I was like, I want to be esoteric, you know, have some little hipster effect to it. So I I put the ublot and then the effet on there. I was like, let's let's make it look cool. And then the idiot I am found out that it's an actual word in I think Turkey or somewhere out in the Middle East. I, I can't really remember directly, and I feel we bad saying it like that, but it's um but it's also kind of cool because more and more and more of what I found out of what it's about, it kind of comes from this weird area, like this region, man, where it's like there are some people that do some weird, dark, mystic shit. And I'm like, perfect. How cool is that? You just make up a word up and you find out that it's actually a real thing. Well, yeah, it, it, the origin of it is from the Lord of the Rings books. It means darkness in the black speech uh, from I, I, I couldn't from even that. find that out. I didn't even know that. Oh yeah, it's uh yeah, it's it's all kind of tied in with that, you know, it obviously all kind of tracks to the same conclusion, which is that Varg Beakerness is a piece of shit. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I trust me, I know I feel guilty liking the guy's music, but also the guy is a complete he's gone in his head, man. He's lost it. Yeah, and you know, I think most people who inevitably get into and explore um more underground metal like the way i did in college was this comes up and you read about it and you listen to it and it is interesting but obviously you have to like kind of make a judgment and you're like oh well he's a pretty fucking wretched awful and remarkably stupid human being too (laughs) and and i know i know (laughs) you know and and it's But it is comforting to know that uh, there are a boatload more artists out there that make very similar styles of music who are not gigantic pieces of shit. And I would encourage you to support those people who are doing nice, non-problematic Dungeon Sith music and associated. Fogweaver. Highly recommend the Fogweaver. Very good music. I listen to a little bit of them. You know, hell, I can't remember half the time I have what I listen to. It's like, I'll lose out for two hours and I've realized I've listened to like 14 different bands. And the one that I remember is the one like two months later, I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm having this in my head now. It's one of those things that just, uh, it's just an unfortunately notable moment in heavy metal history. You know, it's kind of what everybody thinks of, you know, it's so bad. That's why everybody thinks of it. And it is like bad. Oh, it's bad, but I mean, it sounds. This is what's funny. I had a, I have a friend of mine here who's, uh, we're really into black metal, and it's one of the things you have to accept. Black metal has such a dark history. Like at least the pre, like everything before '98 is just fucked up. Whether it's oh, drugs, yeah. murder, everything else, robbing, all of this stuff, and that's some not to, this is not to say you can't accept it it's just that, that is that reality is that if you listen to that earlier music you're going to have to understand that what you're being a part of is a bunch of people who were doing some really fucked up shit does that make you a bad person not at all i mean it's not like i'm going out here and praising the guy's name it's like yeah i listened to his music but you know i was listening to his music when i was 13 and at 13 he wasn't on the internet like he is now. I mean, yes, he, he's always kind of been the shitbag he's been, but he was in prison when I was in school. So it's like... Well, the post- scope on things has just gotten bigger, but also more focused. So people are just, you know, people can react to it more openly. And it's kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, it's it's very, it's clear as day. The lo- The ability to obscure those kinds of things has really diminished. So it's just kind of like, funny to see somebody like bar get fucking really butt hurt about shit like on twitter and it's just like man god just fuck off <laughs> there's, there's so many other people that are like him like okay i lo- this is one of my favorite ones of all time to this day i love him i think he's one of the greatest musicians of all time but i know people are kind of annoyed by him was is um scott wino i love that guy but he had his own moments just of recent too in the last few years it's like yeah, pretty bad move. 
I know. But you know what? Guess what? I'd still go see him one of his shows. That's one of my big problems. It's like, and that's where I think a lot of what some people, I think, have a hard time with heavy metal or just hard rock or the darkest weird shit is that you've been growing up with listening to them. And then there's people who come in and they see them and they're like, yo, you know, they just did this really dumb fucking thing. And you go, yeah, I know. I'm the bad person that's going to still buy the $20 ticket to go see them. I'm sorry. What do you want me to do? I can't help it. But that's why I've moved into how what I'm doing myself is there's people, there's people who want to see or they want to hear the kind of music, but they also look and go, God, the guy's a shit bag. And I go, yep. So now I'm trying to, you know, do whatever I can in my own way to be like, well, if there's something different. I don't know. Yeah, it's like if you can't, uh, you know, if the thing is sort of like, eh, I like this, but the the strings attached are not like the cleanest. If you focus on your own project, you're kind of like fulfilling your own need and like, well, now I'm just making the thing that I want to hear. So yeah, exactly. Right. And your discography is like quite vast at the moment. Um, <laughs> so I, I only checked out a few selected pieces, but like even comparing the earlier work to the recently released um spore session which is a, a actual like recorded performance that you did which is pretty cool um i think you've gotten a handle on manipulating the sound much better you know folks say that playing slow is difficult so you know what how do you find and maintain the rhythm and flow of the music i would like to imagine it is you've been kicked out of a car while you're going about 100 <laughs> miles an hour on the highway and you're told to hey can you walk straight one of my problems is, is that um, I can't remember sometimes very well. Also, I, I, I've i tried to practice, and it every, it's always different. It's never the same damn song, and I'm like, I don't write my music out. I don't, It's just – plus, I've been kind of in this whole thing where I'm like, well, I like jam band music, so I kind of take that as a joke and do what I'm doing and try to just play, just play for like an hour straight. And there's been a lot of stuff that I'm like, that's not good. It sucks. But I kept getting into a pattern of going, okay, one cognitive thought, hold on to that thought and just go with it and let it flow. And the moment you don't like it, stop. But that's actually a technique that I got from video editing when I was in film school was that um, Walter, Mer or yeah, I think it's Walter Murch, or what, his whole thing is that he goes, Press, you know, stop what you're doing when you're bored. And he did one big, huge movie that he's famous for. And he stopped within 10 minutes and he just walked away from it for a week. So that's kind of where I go. The same thing with my music is that it's just one long cognitive thought. And the moment I stop is because I'm done. And so I kind of think of it as like um, someone with, uh, you know, uh, a mental problem, like uh, being like they've been from a, from a car accident or something like that, where it's like your brain physically can't. Because like I had I had had some serious uh, issues years ago, and that I was, I mean, every thirty seconds to a minute, five minutes, whatever, my brain would go stop. Bump. So now it's kind of trying to have to like retrain the brain how to go through and actually remember something or play it a certain way and what does that actually do it's really just like a very serious sense of uh control like you just you have to sort of like know you have, it's it i don't know it sounds to me like it's sort of like more like loose control but you have to know when to cut it off yep and, i mean and you know it, it's like i just think of it as like it's a jam dude else i could start out where i'm starting out and if I can get back to there, then I'm done my job. But if I don't, then there's a reason why I never came back to begin with. It's always kind of like, where am I going with it? And whatever is going to happen is where I'm going even going to work. And so it's always kind of being able to just put yourself out into a constant state of fear that this is going to go bad. And... I've kind of been able to now get out of that to where I'm going to where it's like, I've been able to come back more and more and more and create a pattern when I wasn't able to. And speaking of the spore session, can you talk about putting together that small performance? Like one thing I really enjoyed about it is the 
use of strange like archival footage of like just people doing weird things in sort of like mundane parts of the country which like noise metal is weirdly fitting for have you ever seen trash humpers by uh harmony kareen no i'm i'm uh i am a harmony virgin i have not seen any movies by that guy but uh i've i've got a couple on my list um it's just like he's just a tough dude for me to stomach really uh, well see that see that for me like i grew up watching his style of movies yeah. in real life i never had to watch those movies to know what it's like i'm like i've been around it uh, yeah uh, like so you recognize and like understand that well i mean you know what i did see a movie i don't think he did it um and i feel like this is not the first time i've mentioned it but i have seen a documentary about what is it the, the wonderful um whites or something that movie was so good that was such an amazing documentary i love it what's that doc what's it called it's like the uh, the the wild whites or the wonderful whites, but yeah, it's about the white family out there in West Virginia, and they're all wild and wonderful whites of West Virginia. Yeah, that movie was fucking bonkers. But see, for me, like again, like I grew up in around areas like that, so like watching stuff like that or being seeing and trying to reference art in that kind of way, I'm like, yeah, that's just what I've been around. I mean, but it's yeah. something that you that probably like a spotlight wasn't shown on for a lot of when those movies came out, it was shedding some light on, you know, just this part of the country that didn't really, I mean, I only like what it was like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like the, the last like major sort of like, this is the very rural section of America that, that, you know, the dark underbody that sort of exists in this like Gothic rural world. They only did that thing for like $30,000 and they weren't even originally from Texas and they just chose Texas because that worked for the story in the space because where they were filming it out at that time, trust me, I've been out that way. It's scary as fuck. You wouldn't want to get ever stuck out there. So, you know, it goes that like something like that is the perfect thing ever. It's kind of the same mm -hmm. thing with my music. It's that it's um, they take something that you would think, you know, something, you know, mundane and innocent and turn it into the most darkest, demented parts of our fears is being like you're in the middle of a rural area. You get stuck and you're desolate. You know what I mean? It's like, and so that's, it's the same thing with like Heart Harmony Kareem's work. It's like you watch it and it's, he picks at the darkest, biggest fears, the things you never want to think about, the things you never want to talk about. You know, um, for some of his work, I laugh and go, sometimes some of his earlier work is just a bunch of crack. It's just a bunch of people, someone who smoked a bunch of crack probably and mm -hmm. wrote and then, and then they could write a screenplay. Because, like, he made a book, uh, he wrote a book called uh, Crack Up at the Race Riots, which has no structure, no nothing. There's, like, a whole one chapter, and it's just a note, and it's just a, a grocery receipt. That's that's literally what the page is. So, like, that's kind of why I choose uh, art like that for my work, that it's something that has no structure, no form, no nothing. And out of that, you find that it's the art itself is where the structure comes from, I guess. I don't know if that makes any sense, but. Um, no, it makes sense to me. I originally had wanted to do a piece about uh, Job, uh, the guy from the Bible who basically uh, Satan makes. Oh, I thought you meant the guy from Arrested Development. <laughs> no, 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 I'm talking about, I'm talking about yeah, so the, the story of Job and the long short of it is that it basically uh, Satan comes to God. They try to take this guy and basically say to him, like, you know, prove that, this man would walk away from God. And so God goes and fucks this poor man's life up, kills his daughters, takes everything from him. And what does the guy continuously always do? And he says, oh, I will believe in God. I'll believe in God. But Satan is continuously trying to prove that, like, at the end of the day, that guy would leave him. For me, I look at it and go, no, the actual reality of it is that God was willing to torture someone when somebody else came up to him and said, hey. I bet you this person would leave me. He goes, no, watch this. I will, I will torture this person to the point of death and they will still love me. And so it's a real story of abuse, man. Like it's the most fucked up thing ever. And so I wanted to create a, a piece that emulated that feeling and that whatnot. But um, it came out of a, a I did a jam sesh with somebody for when I did a project called Blood Dove. One day it was kind of going on and whatnot. And I ended up, hitting what i thought was something from um i think it was it is it arctic nights from uh, dark throne there's a song there that he did and it was just 
I hit it. I'm like, oh my god, it sounds like a black metal thing. So I kept going, building off of that and building more and more and more off of that. I got stuck again listening to Earth one day and going back and forth in between to that and just going, all right, how fast, how hard can I go? But also how, um, you know, demented can it be? Can you understand through the distortion of what I'm doing? Do you feel that there's a story to it? But uh, when I went to go actually perform it that day, it fell apart. And that's the other again and again to everything I do is that like, I have this big plan. I'm going to do it. Go and perform it. And it just bleeds and dies right as it, right as it starts. So now it's became a, 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 entitled um, Boastifish. I'm bastardizing that word. But it's, uh, it's Gaelic for um, foolish prodigal. <laughs> And I was just like, I, again, this is half of what I do. I'm just like, I'll just shoot. I'll just make up a joke to myself. And the next thing I know, I'm like, I need to stop doing this because I keep finding words that exist. Because <laughs> <laughs> Boath just means foolish. And I was like, all right, cool. This works to the mm-hmm. mental and all the, the whole, um, I, I don't know what you want to call it. But yeah, just more or less the art of the music of what I do and just all of the lyrics or the title. Actually, there's no real, there's no lyrics yet, but it's just all the titles of songs mm-hmm. and trying to create a theme for what is Boozem. Because, you know, um, like when you listen to Boris, a lot of their stuff is numbers and colors. It's, you know, there's a lot of those kind of ideas or, the, um, you know, sun is all, I mean, at the end of the day, I just laugh and go, it's just sheet music on it. They're just taking sheet music symbols you know <laughs> yeah because everyone's got their like little bit of context to what makes up their band and so for me i always kind of found out that it's more of like my stuff leans towards the esoteric or the mystics or um something that's close to a biblical thing or someone if you're into like uh the what's his name um alejandro jenerowski like my music's for that mm-hmm just sort of like fits in with that experimental nature and goes in with like using that, that, you know, the, the archival footage in your, in your work. It's sort of like, everything's just sort of like floating in this like weird space and it doesn't necessarily like line up, but it all kind of like works sort of like, it's like Italian horror movies. Like just some of that shit doesn't really make any fucking sense. And yet it kind of works, you know, it's like a dream state. Exactly. It's, 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 um, it's a real really, dream state, but a dream state nonetheless. Yeah, no, and I mean, it, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, why does the darkest music have to be the most, I guess, not to say ignored, it's more of like, the, you know, when the, the darkest stuff isn't always the bad, man. It's actually the light. Once you're in the light, everything's exposed. Everything's there. Everything's present. Because in the dark, it can be whatever you want it to be. And that, for me, I think a lot is what a lot of people can't, or at least I just assume that people whenever they have to deal with the darkest parts of their selves or their mind or things that they are, they experience, it's bad. No, not always. That's just what it is. It's that the darkness is the darkness and you got to look past it. But once you're in the light, look for the darkest stuff. Because again, it's that go to the dark, the farthest deep, deepest reaches of something that you can go to and then turn around and see where you're at. It's weird how it's like very, um, I don't know what the word is like, like introspective. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. I mean, that, uh, that's probably the best way to put it, you know, going like listening to this music or going to see a band like sun, or even like, you know, some of the uh, like other bands you mentioned, like, you know, Boris or Bellwitch is a great example because they kind of use this. They had this, when I saw them the first time they performed all of mirror reaper and they had this very like incredibly oh, melancholy, yeah that lucky you for that show yeah just this very melancholy um collection of footage from i don't even know but it looked i don't know if it was like 1930s like europe or like late 1800s europe or something um well i guess there wouldn't have been a camera in the 1800s but like it was very it was at least like a 100 years ago or something like that yeah and um yeah it's it's those kind of those moments where you know, you want to watch the whole performance, but you probably find yourself wandering off, you know, in your brain, like sort of lost. And, you know, it's like a a time when 
that I don't know, I'm kind of like rambling here, but it kind of like gives you a moment to sort of look at things with clarity, maybe. I don't know. If that makes any fucking sense. It's sort of just like, you know, and especially with your stuff, it's like sometimes that's what my brain fucking feels like. I start out and be like, all right, I have I have a a concrete idea and I'm gonna go with it. I wanna I wanna emulate some sound. Okay, I found I found these uh I found the chords or I found the tuning that needs to be in. And then it just disappears because like the pedals I'll do, I'll start going into it and it just goes, all right, it, it, it no longer is what it is like. Um, Cause I use a complete head to toe sun rig and then the pedals I've got all together. It's like, eventually they'll do some weird thing to where I'm playing and there'll be something coming out of it through feedback. And the feedback is going back and forth into its own self so it's like it almost feels like there's two songs going on at once so it's like there's a constant fighting with each other and then all they'll be in unison and when you do that it's like you're not even trying to make what you're doing man so it's always it goes off into something else now uh kind of the unrelated but still related you mentioned that portland maine's metal scene was like pretty gutted by covid um like i had spoken to uh oli from previously of trouble back at the start of the panty and things seem to be like, you know, obviously like, okay, but clearly things have taken a bit of a turn. Yeah, no, it, it's, you know, it's weird. And I'm in no way do I want to sound like I'm the voice of the whole damn thing, but uh, yeah. in terms of what I've seen since I've moved back to new England, because growing up as a kid, there was a presence. I mean, like just the punk scene alone, and then you look at the history of the metal scene and everything, because, you know, you've got bands that were like Kitty Vin and all of these other bands that were around the Hydra, mm -hmm. Hydra record days. There was a time, but obviously, you know, you think about like 2008, like 2007, 2008, when the, that crash happened, a lot of the heavy music scenes up in this way from when it looks like they started to kind of do this, bring it to now. When I moved up here, I remember going to shows and whatnot. And I, it, I hate saying it, but I, I went to a show one time where it was, um, it was Zather and Scott Wino, and it was an acoustic rock tour. There must have been six people in the damn fucking bar, dude. And it was hard. It was disheartening because I had come from like places out in Texas where if that had happened, dude, that would have been too, that would have been packed. It would have been packed. I come to this, no one wanted to go to it. You know, why is that? I don't know. You bring it forward it to complete now in the last eight months. There have been a lot of shows that I've gone to that no one just no one goes to. But then later everyone sees that band at the bar and they come up and they love him and everything. And that's cool. But if you want to have a scene, you got to go support your bands. It doesn't matter if you like them or not. Go to the damn show because they're your friends. Who cares if it's good or bad? Just go. One of the other things, at least in Portland, is... Um, they had a, a festival here that was called the Port Fest, and they took it away. It was one of the coolest things ever. We Portland had its own thing that like dragged in a lot of people, man. It, was, it would be like, imagine 100,000 people in, you know, a little like two block ra radius kind of thing. It was, it was a lot. It was a huge crowd. It was a great time. But now that they, they, that they don't have it, you know, it's fun, but like, you know, you want to go hang out with a lot of people. You want to do a lot of things, and there's not where do I go? It's, it's always kind of go, go to the same place, go to the same thing. And that's nice. I want something different every day, but I also want there to be the loudest and heaviest thing possible because people will come to the, some of the weirdest shows here in town. And the next thing you know, some hardcore band has got people hanging from the rafters. You know, there are people who like push it to the edge, man. But I don't know if they're going to get noticed or not. I don't know if people are even going to really care that that music is happening. Like people just come out to see something just to see something. Cause that's, that's the life in Maine sometimes is that you just come out because dude, there are times where it's, it can be pretty boring. You know, you got to keep yourself constantly, constantly um, trying to do whatever you can. And so like one thing I will kind of just without rambling on is I try to book shows myself and it's been a thing where, yes, I've seen heavy shows. I've seen people put things on. But whether I've got one headliner or two, I always try to put on local bands. 
because those local bands will get seen by a bigger band or a band that just goes around. And hopefully the idea is like, how cool would it be if that band comes in, sees them and goes, hey, we need two people for the next week on this tour with us. We want you. You know, so now these bands from here who just are doing what they're doing, all of a sudden finally get exposure some way and they go out and they do whatever. That's what I'm trying to do. And there's other people doing it as well, too. I'm not, uh, there are other people who are really are coming together and we're trying to keep a hard rock scene here because for us, that's the funnest thing, man. You know, we have a a club here in in town that brings on some local stuff. They had a change of hands and whatnot and what they're doing. So a lot of the hard rock stuff wasn't there at all this whole summer when we could have had stuff. So now it's left to people like me and others that are like, all right, we're going to be the ones that do it. You know, if they're not booking it, we got to book it or it's not going to happen. I'm in Brooklyn, New York. So like, I don't really have to worry about not being able to go to a concert. There's almost, you know, I say it a lot. There's almost too many concerts happening sometimes in New York and you're like, God damn it. But you know, I don't really know that. I would imagine too, like Portland, Maine is, it's kind of like, you know, you're all the way on the fucking top tip of the Eastern, you know, seaboard. It's like kind of a tough, is it a, it's a, is it a tough market to hit? Cause like, Give there's not, a- there, you can't like fly in really. Like, I guess unless you drive there and then start going down South. Like, I feel like it's always a first tour stop and then people head down. Well, it's weird. We, we're, a, a, I like to think of it as that we're a middle, we're a middle tour thing. So like, um, people hit Canada probably first, right? Well, it's like some, someone could go to Burlington and then they'll go to, or you can go to Burlington and then straight across to, to Maine. And then they would go to Boston or they would come up to Boston. Like we're never a start or an end. We're always mm-hmm. in between because like you were, like you just said, if they were to come or go to Canada, exactly. I'll give you an example of like a show is uh so in June, primitive man's coming up this way, but there's, there's, st- they're going to be in Boston and then they're going to come to us before they go on to something, whether they go to Canada or they go to, it's rare. I think ever anyone comes comes from somewhere and then they go straight from Portland to Pennsylvania or straight from Portland to Ohio. Like it's some, I it, that's a, that's a left or right. It's always, cause I mean, we're 90 minutes North of Boston, but remind yourself once you're 90 minutes North of Boston, you now turn around and you're two hours from somewhere else. You know what I mean? Right. And to go from Portland, Maine to PA sounds like a fucking drag. Dude, I saw was it I when I saw when I saw Blood Incantation, they they were or not blood, yeah it was uh there was a I can't remember one of the local band like a small band that they called up for it, but they drove up six and a half hours from Pennsylvania just to play that show in Boston, and I think of shows like that where I'm like we don't get that in Portland, but also you know you think now that you drive six and a half hours like that that now becomes a like a nine hour drive up and a nine hour drives back. That's a full day of driving. Yeah. That you, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wanted to go see uh blood incantation and primitive man last December, but I, uh, you know, just, it was around the holidays and, you know, had to go see the family. And so that was one that I had to just eat, unfortunately, but the way I see it is, these guys clearly are not stopping touring anytime soon. No. So there's there. And that's, it. that's kind of been one of the things about um, like living in Maine compared to other places is the type of bands that come through. We get, look, we get heavy bands. Okay. We get heavy bands. We do like we've had, we've had Boris in a really small club playing with uniform. And that was so oh, that fun. Sounds, that was yeah. So cool. uh, I saw that tour. Oh but man. Now, uniform whips. Oh my god, dude! That was some of the coolest stuff ever. But what what I what I think sucks though is that um, so because of COVID, that was one of the like a club where heavy, heavy, heavy bands came all the time. We did yeah. right saw there, like as a high tone son of a bitch. I don't know if you have heard of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was um, that venue closed and is now an arcade. Wow. But again, during COVID, every venue around town closed. Almost every single one of them was thinking. We don't know how long this is going to go. So places were starting to get ready to sell themselves. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Now that things are back up, we're left kind of with a flesh dripping off the bone corpse dying. <laughs> oh, oh, you know, we look like a feral dog that we're just like hoping, you know, <laughs> leave us alone. 
and we've come out of the rain. We're trying to dry off, but we don't know how to dry off. And it's like the more we book them, eventually people are going to see that. Oh, hey, hey, there's there's stuff going on. Yeah, because I mean, I've been to Portland, Maine. We went up uh, a couple years ago uh, for my birthday and uh, in October. It's a cool town. I dug the shit out of it, man. A lot of good food, uh, a lot of good beer. I'll tell you that much. There's um, a lot. Of <laughs> like I took, you know, went to a cool record store. It was it was just a fun town to walk around and just take pictures at the very least. But um, I see that you could definitely come back. You know, it would be cool to see that happen again. And it would be cool to see like that festival come back on your end too. Yeah, no, I mean, like, look. I love this town. I really honestly would rather live here than some other places. Like I lived in Austin, Texas. I'd go move back in Austin, Texas in a heartbeat, but it's like, in terms of where I, that's a hub, you know? Yeah, exactly. Is that like, you know, I look at it and go, well, why not create another hub up here? Why, why do I, why do I, why do I got to drive or fly somewhere to be a part of something when I can create it here? And then it has to come to me for once. Cause I've always chased everything. I've always been chasing something and never tried to stay in one place and bring it to me. And that is a big, huge thing that's kind of about here in Portland. And so it's, um, and it's, this is not a negative comment in any way. It's just that Maine is like Florida. It's a tourist state. Like that, that's the right. best. If you really think about who's here half the year, tourists, like that's our income. That is our life bread. That's the only reason why some of these businesses in town can even exist, because without it, they'd have no one showing up. No one would go to the, half the farthest of the middle of nowhere. You know, that's not what people are going to want to do. People are working their asses off right now uh, to make it so that the locals can be here. And the locals are the one creating the circle and not the other way around. But that also kind of goes to the shows that are put on in town. Some of the biggest shows I've seen out here are like, like Billy Strings. I have no idea who that is. <laughs> I have no idea who that was. And people are like, oh, he's this really cool guitarist. I'm like, all right, great. Uh, outside of this, and I'm, I'm standing outside the venue going, yo, there's 400 people blowing off balloons. I want to know why there's that kind of crowd out here. <laughs> For and Billy fucking Strings. Billy fucking Strings had a, had a, had a collection of fish fans outside of that show and I, for two days and I go, all right, a bunch of wooks. I'm a wook by (laughs) Hey, that's a, that's where I came from, man. I came out from a festival. Okay. My music was created off of a, off of a wood stage in the middle of the woods. And I went, I'm doing this. So I am a wook by definition. It's just that, um, I, I saw what they are doing, what they did. And I went, well, how do we, the locals get that same type of crowd? us not someone that's been brought into town but people someone from in town that generates that you know and we've started to have some local bands who just like they'll always be at least 100 people for it you know and that's and for us that's cool the fact that you got 100 people out on a wednesday night for us we think that's awesome because we've been at shows where it's eight people maybe 10 by the end of it you know, we, we, there are really have been some low number shows and I know that people were, they're very hesitant to come back out again, or they're just like, they might be hurting for, you know, um, they're broke or, you know, they're the COVID stuff really when people with masks and I, 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 I don't care. I don't care what anyone's opinions are. I like be smart, be safe. It's people use the excuse. Oh, I don't know. They're willing to let, like I said, that fear hold them back because they're afraid of something bad's going to happen. And that's why I come out. Like, I go, look, if this is the show I'm going to die at, cool. At least I came out and supported something. And I know that that's not the best thing to say. It's not probably maybe not the wisest, but my attitude is you can't not to be carefree, but put yourself in a space of being vulnerable with other people because you realize you're supporting people who are just as nervous as you are to be doing it at this, you know, they're just as equally as afraid, but if they see other people coming out and seeing them, they start to warm up and eventually you start to see other people go, Oh, 
if you're coming out, I'm going to come out because the less you come out, man, it's going to die. And so like, that's why, like, at least I do it is like, if, if I don't do this and if somebody else is not going to do it, it's going to go away. So when you want to see a hard, heavy band, you're going to have to drive to Boston. You're going to have to pay a hundred dollars just to do whatever you're going to do. By the time you're done, you might've spent three to $400 when you could have spent 40 bucks here in town. Yeah. And I mean, of course there's other factors, you know, some, you know, people got their, got health issues and they can't do yeah. it or whatever. And like, you know, right now, this month of March, you know, I went to a lot of concerts, uh, you know, things are okay right now, you know, it's kind of like a window and I'm going to try to take the uh, opportunity to see as much fun stuff as I can, you know, and I take my precautions and, you know, it's still a little bit dodgy, you know, and I mean, like I'm working and like I work in customer service in person. So like, you know, that's always like a thing, but you know, for the moment, it's like, you know, it's all right. And, you know, I would like to take advantage of as, you know, many opportunities as I can, but, you know, it's, it's, I think it all just comes down to like people's comfort levels and like, you know, it is important to go out and see shows, but I think, you know, there's, there are other ways people can of course support bands, um, you know, through merch and I'm sure people still are continuing to do that. And, you know, I'm happy to like band camp Fridays is still a thing. There's such an oversaturation, but you know, that's what the democratization man of technology does. Um, I was in, uh, I was trying to be in, I was trying to be in filmmaking for shit forever. I went to, I graduated from school from it. I've been around some really big, huge, big things, you know, but um, it would be, imagine there's a hundred thousand jobs and you got 5 million people that want those a hundred thousand jobs. You can't win. You're not going to make it. You know, you're you're going to you're going to bleed yourself dry. You're, you're going to uh, and you're also going to be eventually thrown to the wolves and be ripped apart. And when it comes to like doing the music thing, you know, there's always been 10 million people trying to get into the 10 venues in town. You know what I mean? Right. And now everyone could do you could do a, a, a live YouTube show out of your bedroom. And make more money doing I, that. I have you. done a live show out of my bedroom. <laughs> but you understand, you could make more yes. money out of your bedroom than you could going to a club and playing your music. Right. Yes, exactly. And so now there's, you've opened up avenues to people who could never go anywhere. You know, some people never get anything in there. Some people probably never even go to Alaska. But yet now that person in Alaska could watch all these bands down in New York City or someone down in, um, someone in Alabama doing a live show and they're supporting music that way. And the next thing you know, they're getting to be a part of something that they couldn't otherwise. I mean, shit. Like I've, like I've said before, I've talked to people in fucking Australia and Italy and got to see like their performances on YouTube and whatnot. It's, I mean, it's the way that the scene adapted during the last couple of years was very cool. And it, it built a lot of bridges between folks, you know, and that now yeah. that things are going back to normal, it'll be interesting to see like, you know, what happens from here? You know, things are going to go back to this the status quo or are people going to be willing to be like, hey, you know, we couldn't make the tour for whatever reason, but we're still planning to do actually like a, a live stream performance of it, um, you know, on Sunday. If you want to watch it, here's the link. You know, it's like $10 to watch. Like, are people going to be inclined to support that in lieu of not being able to see a show or... Is it just going to be like the old days where like canceled tour, lost a lot of money or, you know, what have you. So I feel like it's unless you have like a really good, strong, stable, you know, group of people coming out and supporting you and buying tickets and merch. It's like you got to kind of like assess it and whatnot. So, I mean, I just saw that um, a bunch of bands dropped off of Desert Fest in the UK for fucking any number of reasons. And it's like. There's also a bunch of other bands from the States that are still playing there. So, you yeah. know, it's like, what's going on? It's one of those things where, you know, I get the, so like, say for something for like Desert Verse, I'm not, I'm just speaking off of hypothetical. Yeah. It's like, you, you get a big, huge festival, and then all of a sudden your three biggest headliners drop off. I mean, welcome literally to like every single Psycho Las Vegas in the past. Like, oh, there's always some big thing that happens there yep. but yeah, yeah that just happened too like monster magnet had to drop off from the new york one and they were a headliner because 
Dave Windorf like injured his back or something. I'm like, you know, like, uh, yeah, you know, I get it. Like, you, dude injured his back. You probably can't fucking sing. I know what it likes. I know what it's like to have a shitty back. I have a shitty back. So well, yeah, I'm coming down for that, actually. Oh, you are nice. I, yeah, I'll, you, I'll be there all weekend. Me? Are you kidding me? No, the, when I saw that I was gonna, I was able to go to that. I'm like, I'm doing it. But like, you know, at least, at least you can still go support a Thomas bitch, a bitch wax. You know, that's the one thing that I like is that if there's still these festivals where the big band dropped off, well, at least if one of the members is going because they're in another band, at least you can still see something. But it does make it hard now that you like, like if some a band drops out and whatnot, do I still want to make it out? And that is kind of my comment back to like what's going in Portland. It's like if something drops off or something's not happening, it's like, dude, still come out because there are people who, let's say if you were that guy on that tour and you, you're hoping to at least make gas money you're still coming out and supporting and that's the thing that i think is hard for people is do i want to do that do i want to come out because i could have been doing something else instead and i go well what else would you be doing instead of going to the show that you were going to go to you know yeah and i guess also it's like your investment in it it's like well if the head if like the main act dropped off and like i'm kind of mum on the second band and I have no idea who the opener is, then like, do I really want to go? So like for people like me who like are into smaller acts and whatnot, like, yeah, I, I could like see some people like, I'm still going to go. Cause like I dig it and like, I have the ticket and may as well, I got nothing else to do. And, but I could also see why people would, you know, drop off and it just like, you know, just the reality of it just sucks. Yeah, it does. But that's also the whole thing is like, that's why I love, you know, if I go to a show and something's like, oh, I don't know who anybody on the bill is. I know one band, that's it. What if I find out that that's the next, like, whatever band I see is, like, the next going to be some next big band or that's going to be the next band I'm going to start listening to for the next 10 years? I don't know. Well, I like, like, I'll give you a good example. Like, I just went to go see Full of Hell, and I... Oh, who was that? Oh, it was great. Like, I've been wanting to see Full of Hell for so long. Couldn't see them at Psycho Las Vegas one year because they were playing at the same time as the Misfits, and I'm not going to pass wow. up that opportunity. Like, come on. They got added to the bill. Like, I'm not going to pay extra to see the Misfits. This is perfect. So, sorry. And then I think they came through and I couldn't see them or whatever. So, I so I finally got to see them. And then they had, like, who like who was opening for them? Nomos, which is, like, grind. A lot. Of, it was, like, a lot of grind and death metal. So, oh, it was, yeah. like, Nomos and uh, Jarhead Fertilizer and uh, Chapang, who, like, I have no, I've known of, I've heard of Chapang, and, like, I've heard good things about uh, jarhead fertilizer and i have this stupid uh superstition that i cannot listen to a band on the day that i'm going to see them at concert because they will just fall off the bill they and ruin it for everyone and it's a stupid superstition but one of my best friends and i we are we abide by it very very hard so I forgot to listen to the bands and I was like, all right, I guess I'm just going to find out what they're like when they're there. And I like doing that. And needless to say, all the bands were fucking fantastic. I am oh, yeah. very excited to be able to see Jarhead Fertilizer again when they open up for Candle Mass of all fucking bands. Okay. That's going to be interesting. But no, you're, you know, I have a friend of mine who's got the exact same superstition. And I'm the guy that uh, was like, because I, I used to go to see the Drop McMurphys. And what did you do when you went to go see a Dropkick Murphy show? You would put on all the Dropkick Murphy songs that you, you tried to cram in in a one-hour drive, every song, because you wanted to have in your head those songs so that when they would sing, you get to sing out loud with them. You know, like, that was how I always was growing up. But yeah, I totally get not wanting because you're like, it would really suck, play it, and then they not show up and you're like all hyped up for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, that's weird though, because I feel like I could get behind that. That feels like an exception to the rule. But in terms of what I listen to with heavy metal and with like the disappointment that echoes so hard with fans when a certain band can't perform, it's just like, yeah, I gotta just stick with it. <laughs> yep, I know, I know what you mean though. Besides the spore release, do you have anything else in the works right now? Um, I mean, I guess you're always experimenting. It's not, a, I mean, there's a part of it where it's like, um, I'll sit around and then I'll, you know, I'll shoot the idea of something. And the next thing you know, I'm like, I could have something, I could have something happening tomorrow. I wouldn't really know. Off the top hand, uh, so I have been trying to play live with my band. So I haven't really played live at all. Yeah, mm -hmm. you 
I might have played somewhere or around and whatnot, but in terms of the venue scene in Portland, no. I just played my first one uh, a couple weeks ago, and then I'll have it. I'll have my next show uh, at the end of the month. Other than that, I have nothing slated for this band at all. It's always been booking shows and whatnot. And if there's a, a, a weird opportunity where I'm like, hey, this is a grindcore show. I got a friend of mine who does drums and they need a local band. Me and him, are gonna, we're going we're gonna to go make a one-time project and we're going to be the grindcore. We're going to be the local grindcore band, you know? <laughs> Just stuff up and go, fuck it, we're going to do it this way. I mean, uh, that there's got to be a history of bands that existed for one night only that were fucking awesome. That's got to be oh, like oh. some internet article out there. Oh my God, dude, that forever, forever in a day. That's what happened. That, that for me, as far as I'm concerned, is probably half of the bands in New Orleans. Or Florida. <laughs> I mean, for me, when I, um, there are so many different bands that I saw when I lived in Florida back uh, between 05 and 08, where you'd see them one time and then the guys were just like, oh, we don't really want to play anymore. You know, there's so many, there's, there's so many, I mean, that, that is punk and metal to the, to the T of going, yeah, that's a one-time bill, but it was the greatest thing ever. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. I mean, you could probably even have four people that are in like the same band and they'll just be like, oh no, this isn't this band. We're just doing this. Well, are you yep. going to play again? No, we, we just wanted to do something different. We just couldn't call it this. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that's something I always saw as a, as a, um, and whatnot, and I can't remember. It's like, um, what was it? Pen Temple uh, from Sun O was was a one time thing. You know, they did. They went and did that show down in Australia, and they called up their friend. That was it, as far as I know. That that was a one time show. But look what they recorded, and it was one of the sickest, coolest fucking things ever. Have you been listening to anything lately of note? So I'm really into this band, Melissa, um, out of uh, New York. They are about gender non-binary and trans and all of that and for me i'm like dude it's the sickest fucking thing in black metal and to be aggressive and to be all up into the gore element and just jesus i mean they do this whole black and crust black metal thing that i thought was the sickest thing ever and i'm like all right you know the element of violence and the element of just in your face mayhem style music still exists and i was like hell and you know, it was, it's cool. I love, I love their stuff so much. 18 minutes record, boom, in and out. It was cool. Yeah. I'll check them out. They're from my neck of the woods. Well, what about yourself? Uh, let's see. There's uh, this new band. They're based out of New York city. Um, I'm not really sure what the, who's in the band or what their relation is, but it's like this blackened death metal band called A AV. I oh my god, I can't even like say this. AV turn, AV turn, or something like AV turn. No, I haven't heard of them. And uh, it's fucking amazing. <laughs> it's it's fantastic. I guess they've been around since 2018, but they just put out their first full length. And I just am gonna see if there's a a band that I recognize on here. Okay, so one of the guys is in Artificial Brain. That doesn't surprise me at all. That band is awesome, too. Um, but yeah, the uh, the Ailing Facade by Ave... A oh my god, I can't fucking say this. The Ailing Facade by AV Turn, I think is how you say it, is a okay. great record. You should listen to it. Also, the new Falls of Raros album, Key to a Vanishing Future, is fucking amazing, too. Oh, please. Those guys um, are Yeah, they rule. And something that's totally not heavy metal my friend told me about this dude named swamp dog and he put out a new record called i need a job so i can buy more auto-tune and yeah, I, I just listened to that the other day oh dude it's awesome and like i don't i didn't know anything about this guy uh his real name is jerry williams jr and he's been around for forever like he's been around since like 19 since the 50s like yeah this dude's been around forever uh great record really strongly recommend checking it out it, it was uh it was just an absolute joy to listen to nice no i got um it's not do he's not doom but uh coleman williams or uh hank williams the fourth i've been listening to some of his stuff a lot lately because uh he was supposed to have been on a, a tour with i hate god 
and uh, I think Capra was playing. Who Capra is? Um, I got to see them. Oh yeah, I've heard Capra's pretty good. I haven't checked them out. Oh my god, live, dude! You kind of get a little, you get a little scared because she is just the most aggressive fucking singer I've seen in the last few years, and it was, it was crazy. I mean, the crowd was was more into them almost a little bit until like, you know, Sissy Space that came on, you know, people liked Capra a little here more than the blood incantation. And I was like, okay, but these are just, they, they came at it, but yeah, no, sadly that the show I'm talking about got canceled. And I was like, great. I, cause I like to go to a mixed bill, man, you know, a band that's like yeah. it's all, all metal bands. And then you got a kind of a country singer kind of thing. But yeah, I've been listening to like uh more laid back stuff like that lately as well. Well, I saw, um, oh, fuck, what's his name? Oh, I saw Joe Buck Yourself open it up for Weed Eater. Like, it was awesome. Guy just sat on a stool, played a guitar, yelled at the sound guy the entire time, and it was great. I, I loved well, it. Funny, funny you mentioned him. I got, um, that's, actually, that's actually who I got coming up uh, in the end of April here. Oh, nice. Joe Buck, yeah, it'll be a good show. No, I've, uh, I got to see them with uh, Weed Eater, and it's funny, Joe, Joe for what... I got to figure out more of this, but I, I met Joe Buck for the first time. He looks at me and goes, I know you from somewhere. And somehow in my life, that could actually be true. <laughs> I get that a lot. It's strange. You know, it's strange when very large, imposing men are like, hey, do I know you? And I'm like, oh, boy. And well, most well, of the time, it turns out okay. Actually, talking about Dave Windorf and how Monster Magnet are playing, I bumped into Dave Windorf at an Uncle Acid show a few years ago where I was talking to somebody else who knew him. And he's just like, hey, man, I fucking know you, right? And I was like, I, I don't think so. He was, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your name? <laughs> it was very bizarre to be recognized uh, by somebody for considering they absolutely do not know me. Right. But I, I mean, it, it's one of those things where it's like, what if, like, I know for me, sometimes like I've gone out the bars, been drunk, hanging out with people and whatnot, or. I was I was somewhere in some other town, state, whatever, and you were talking to some guy one day, and all of a sudden it's like five years later, you're like, son of a bitch, we do know each other. <laughs> yeah. That's a, 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 my life has been that small where I'm like, um, uh, we just had a show up here, and the guy was doing visuals, and he lived in Austin at the very same time I did. We used to go to everywhere. We know the same people. And we started talking and whatnot, and we're like, yeah, we probably hung out, and we just, it, it, that's how my whole life has been lately, is that I've been running into old circles that, at the time, we never really paid attention to, to each other, and now it's like, oh, oh, hey. <laughs> it's a small world. Let's see, is there anything else? Uh, Dead Meadows Peel Session, fantastic, highly recommend. I love them. First time ever listening to Bad Reputation by Thin Lizzy. It's fucking awesome. Really? Oh, yeah. God. Thin, thin Lizzy, oh my God, man! If there's ever if there's ever a band that people need to pay attention to, is them. You want yeah, to know how to, like, you know how to play heavy bass? Go listen to them, and then forget everything else. You know. Yeah, and like I I don't say this as an insult, but like I'm not like a Thin Lizzy fan the way some people are, just like you know huge fans of them. But I've always liked them. But like so like you know kind of having that not maybe that massive like uh fanaticism for them is kind of good for me because that I was like damn this record fucking rules just like amazing band just a truly amazing band well if you're ever into the if you're ever looking into the music from Ireland man go look up Rory Gallagher that sounds uh, familiar so he was a blues music he was a blues guitarist from the band Taste this guy I'm sorry has some uh for what 30 years had some of the best fucking riffs oh my god just and not only that, he was he was able to play everything that you think of like what Jimi Hendrix could do. This guy did this far better, but no one ever knows of him. He passed away at 47, but um, was one of the coolest underground musicians of all time. But yeah, he did these big, huge, big, massive tours, you know, and that for me is like there's all it goes back to the idea of whole idea of oversaturation. There's all these other bands and musicians that existed 50 years ago that, you know, at least people like us now are like finding out going, oh my God, this is so cool. Why does no one know of them? And then you go and find out it's like, there's been hundreds of bands and hundreds of musicians that are like that. So it's like, 
you got to find what you like and just try to see if you find something new. Is there anything you want to plug or pr- uh, promote? Let's see. I want to promote the local bands that are up here. There's uh, there's Sterling Black. I got friends of mine in a band called God Emperor Penguin. They got a new thing coming out soon in a month or two or something. You want to talk? You want to talk about a heavy fucking band right now? Is them God Emperor Penguin? Penguin is about going to be one of the coolest fucking bands you are ever gonna. Oh my Jesus, man! You know I got uh, a friend of mine band Coven's. There's the Bumbling Woohaws, who are like this art folk punk thing. So then there's uh, Drodiga, there's Cadaverette. Oh my God. Yeah, there's, if you, I mean, look, I'll say this. If you start to just go see the stuff that I've got going through on the Instagram that I have, I promote a lot of what I can from the local stuff that I'm always at. And it's just, it's different shows as much as I can possibly do. And if you see there, you'll under, you'll see what we've got going on. It's like I've, I've eased because I um, I'm part of a street team here mm-hmm. for one of the venues in town. And we're always trying to promote however we can shows and whatnot. So there's there's a lot to, to run down. But, yeah, like those like all the people I just mentioned, you check out that you'll start to really kind of see what's kind of going on up here. Right on. And yourself, like where can people find you and uh, and the uh, boozum sounds? Let's see. Uh, you can find me on Bandcamp. You can find me on Spotify. Uh, I have a handmade cassette tape that's been out. That's been out. It's been out for uh, almost a year now. Is her flowers? That's an album I made and dedicated to Andrea Yates. So if you get the handmade tape cassette, you'll see a photo of Andrea Yates on it. And that and there's only eight, and there was only eight made, and I gave them to the store, and that's it. But you can you can go and find my stuff in the middle of in the, in the middle of nowhere. But if you're wanting to see me again i'll be playing with joe buck yourself uh april 29th but outside of that it's just you'll have to find me around town someday (laughs) you'll find you'll find me at you'll find me at a show uh and if you see me with my uh my best on run up and say hi awesome will do um well i'll see you in may hope you know hopefully everything tracks for that and uh But up until then, man, like stay safe and all that good shit. And that'll do it for this chapter of the diary. Well, dude, thank you so much for having me. And, you know, uh, I got to say, this is the, the first interview. So it's really cool that you're the, you're the one, man. Oh, wow. <laughs> what a fucking honor. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, mean, it means something, man, that, you're, that I get to be, you know, you're the first one, man. So it's, it's cool. Thank you.
What? Why? Why? Why is my computer freaking out? I need a new mouse. I fucking hate Apple mouses. They're the worst.